We started this year off with a theme that the Lord had given us, and this is the year of spiritual, and this is still the year of spiritual obedience. Each year should be that, but there's a lot of emphasis placed on this year. This year has proven to have a lot of challenges and a lot of ups and downs, a lot of uh, challenges not only in our country but throughout the world. But you know, every challenge begins with you. You see, everything must be individualized because as we individualize these challenges, we also have to put a composite of bringing it together in a oneness that we can only ratify, that we can only clarify, and we can only justify, and that's to following the word. Sometimes we forget we are the body of Christ. And because of that, there's a certain anointing that we carry. There's a certain power that each and every one of us individually possess. Utilizing it. You know, when the scriptures say one can put a thousand flight and two can put ten thousand flight, that's just not idle talk. That's challenges of spiritual warfare that's going on all over the world. But the greatest spiritual warfare that's going on is in you. What are the challenges, and we and this is part three, we start a series of teachings and say, where are your real treasures being stored? And when we came out with this right here, and this is an emphasis behind that, because, because where your heart is, the scripture says, and we'll read that again, yeah, that's where your treasure's going to lie. And sometimes we have to ask ourselves that question. Are we setting up to stay here on the earth, or are we really setting up to move on because we're just passing through? That's the question you must ask yourself. In this part three segment of this teaching here, the question, I, and I note it down here, what value do you place on God and contentment? See, that places a, that, that, that question answers a lot of questions concerning you. You see, are you really content with being a disciple of Christ? Are you really content of knowing who you are and whose you are? Are you really content of knowing that you don't walk by sight, but you walk by faith? Are you really content in knowing that in the long run, God will never put more on you than you can bear? You see, there's a godly contentment that goes along how you feel or where you put your treasures. The scripture tells us it's not what comes into a man's mouth or a woman's mouth that defiles them, but what comes out. Because what comes out comes from the heart. As a man think of in his heart, a woman think of his heart, so are they, or so is he or she. I'm just trying to get you to just look and see where we are. We started out here, oh, in Matthew, and I'm moving real fast here because I want to get to a particular scripture. We started in Matthew, in the sixth chapter of the book of Matthew, and we, we started out in verse 19. Tell you what, I, I, I want to just take that. I want to take that even further because there are some things that I, I wanted us just to really get to here. Just to really get to. But in the scripture, it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasure. That's verse 19, the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth which moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. You know, every day we have to ask ourselves, where is my real treasure being located? Where, where is it really being stored? Even though I'm in the world and not of the world, am I focusing more on what I have here or what I have and what I feel is going to be my permanent home? with God up in heaven. You see, that's a challenge that you've got to ask yourself. You know, we know for a fact that while we're on earth, the scriptures say God will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. So that should be a, one of the things that we worry about here. Matter of fact, the scripture says here, it says, verse 21, for where your, heart, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And the thing about that is that you got to really locate what is your heart pertaining to who you are and whose you are. It goes on, it says, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye is single, the whole body should be full of light. But if that eye be evil, that whole body should be full of darkness. If therefore the light 
and that is in thee is darkness. How great is that darkness? And, and we know that. We're, we're children of the light. We're not children of darkness. We shouldn't be in a state of always what I call worry, flux, and, and, and being discontent. We should be in a state of contentment no matter what because of knowing exactly who we are. The challenge, the challenge, I had to put some notes on this thing here, it's tough because there's a lot of emphasis of placing, we place a lot of emphasis on trying to be successful here on the earth. And, and is, is, it, is it a natural earthly success or is it a spiritual success? We have to differentiate what it's all about. You can, you can own half of the population on this earth, I mean, for its resources, but that doesn't mean that you're spiritually successful. A lot of people have what you call ill-gotten gain. And the challenge is, God has the power to make one rich. And add no sorrow in two. But the challenge is, what is the aftermath of all of this once you receive it on earth? Does that establish a position up in heaven for you? I know Jesus said that in my Father's house there are many mansions. And he will play a prepared place. And where he is, we'll be also. But the challenge is, we're the one who really, and I use the term, help furnish that mansion for how we carry ourselves and what we do here on the earth. I, I was noting some things here. And, and, and Jesus even spoke about that we have to really watch. As verse 21 says, where is your heart really located? Is it here on the earth? Or is it up in heaven? One of the things we went through a, a, a teaching, go back to verse 19, Matthew chapter 19. One of the things I'm kind of glad Real Good Night was read, but he's always teaching about perfection and, and, and the challenge that, that people have. And, and, and our perfection is lies with Christ. That's where our perfection lies with us and inside of us. But, but we even looked at the young, the young ruler there in uh, chapter 19, verse 16. And I want you to just, just relax a little bit. Take a deep breath. And let's kind of absorb this within ourselves. See, sometimes we have to look in the mirror. And we've got to actually begin to see what's really there. Are you listening to me, brothers and sisters? Sometimes you have to look in that mirror and see what is really, I mean, really there. You might be pleased with what you see, but is God pleased with what you're looking at? That's a good question, isn't it? You might feel that you're walking rightly, but are you walking righteously in the eyes of the Lord? What are you really seeing when you look at that mirror? Over here, and we look at the story about the young rich ruler, and he came to Christ and he said, Good Master, verse 16, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? That's a question we're all asking. As a believer, that's going to be a question that you need to ask and, and kind of know by this time, especially I call myself a, a senior citizen. I, I'm not really a senior citizen. I'm a seasoned citizen. But the challenge is, where really are you? And understanding your position when you leave third today. The young ruler asked the question, and he said, and then Jesus answered quite quickly, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if thou would enter into life, keep the commandments. And you're talking about the life that you're trying to seek out. And verse 18, he said to them, which Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not be a false witness. Honor that mother and that father that thou love thy neighbors thyself. The young man said to them, All these things have I kept from my youth, what like I? Yet, Jesus said to them, if thou will be perfect, oh, Reverend, good night, like that one. If thou should be perfect, I'm not in your Bible. He states here, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. To me, that was simple. He asked, he said, what, what do I need to do to ensure 
that I'm going to have eternal life, I'm going to live forever, that I'm going to really be where you're coming from? Isn't that a question? How, how do we know that we know that we know? And Jesus gave this man an example. He knew where it's really hard. See, God knows our heart. We think we know our heart. He tells us to guard our heart. And, and the young man responded. But when the young man that heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Where? On earth. His, he was trying to shield. He, he wanted to go to heaven. But he didn't want to give up what he had on the earth to get there. Does that make sense? You gotta ask yourself. It's the old cliche, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. He came to the Son of God asking him, you know, tell me what I need to do. What do I need? I'm asking, what do you need to do? Now, the concept, God wants him to have things. He wants us to have things. Because he's a supply of our needs. And he even tells he gives the desires of a heart right here on the earth. But the challenge is, we're just passing through. This is a temporary location. And the young men, they say, look now, what do I need to do to get there? And, 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 and Christ put him on the line and said, look, go sell all your possessions. Everything, all your possessions, what you have here. Forget about them, and you come follow me. You can ask yourself, did he really want to follow Jesus? Was he really thinking about the life after he leave this earth? Where are you with this today? Are you so caught up in trying to get what you can on this earth rather than trying to store what you can up above? When the young man, verse 20, when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, he had great possession. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Rich where? On the earth. Up above. He said, and again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter to the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? Jesus answered them, but Jesus said, he beheld them and said to them, With men is it impossible, with God all things are possible. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? See, they did what he didn't want to do. But you said, well, maybe they didn't have the possessions he had. It doesn't matter. Either you know where you want to be, you know where you want to go, and you know where your real home lies. That's where you should be building your treasures. But what treasures are we talking about? Let's go ahead and finish this out. He said, verse 28, Brother, brother, I say unto you that ye which have followed me, ye which have followed me, ye which have followed me, is that you we're talking about here now? In the regeneration, when the Son of Man should sit on the throne of his glory, he also should sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes. These were his disciples. Then he goes to verse 29 and says, And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or fathers, or mothers, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, he says here, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Does your having a, a nice 25 mansion house here on the earth, does that exceed you having eternal life, living forever with Christ? Do you feel that that greater possession here on the earth is more important than that greater possession that you can receive above? Don't get me wrong. God will give you these things. But the challenge is, do these things possess you or do you possess those things? And then you said, thing. your soul. There's a song that say, I don't want to own the whole world and give up my soul. Do you? He says here, but they that are first shall be last. And the last shall be first. I had to note this stuff here. He wants he wants to have eternal life. He wants to walk in perfection, but he wasn't really willing to give up the things in the natural that's here on earth to walk in the fullness of what God has. He said, everlasting life. Tell you what.
Turn over to 1 Timothy. Let's go to 1 Timothy. Third chapter. That's what I wanted to get to today anyway. 1 Timothy. Third chapter. Follow with me on this one right here now. I want you to just, just read with me. Third chapter. And, 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 and this is what we all should be teaching, not only to others, but to ourselves. You're still looking in the mirror, I hope. Are you still, are you still looking in the mirror trying to find out what you see over there? Or are you content with what you see? It says here, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. According to godliness. See, I, I, our challenge is just to perfect godliness with inside of us. He set the word to heal and deliver. Deliver us from our own self and to heal us from our own sins. But the challenge is these are designed to get us to that, that state of godliness. Our perfection is in God's word and, and adhering to God's word and living in God's word. That's where our perfection really lies. He said, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doing about, going about, doubting about questions and strife of words, whereof come of envy, strife, realism, and even surmising. Now, let me, let me read this from Apple. We're going to bring some clarity. Verse 3 and verse 4 in the Amplified. It says, But if anyone teaches otherwise and does not assent to the sound and wholesome message of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and the teaching which is in agreement with godliness, piety towards God. Verse 4, Amplified. He is puffed up with pride and stupefied with conceit. <laughs> Oh, stupefied, boy, that's a good thing. Although he is hopefully ignorant, not knowing, he has a morbid fondness for controversy and disputes and strife about words, which result in produce envy, jealousy, quarrels, and dissensions, abuse, insult, and slander, and base suspension. Do you be around a person that's supposed to be saved to always argue about something? Always got some stuff going on. Always in a state of flux, not only with themselves but with others. But they say, oh, I'm saved. I'm just as if. You got to walk in your salvation. The Bible says you can tell a tree by the fruit it bears. You know? You're supposed to be fruit inspectors. Start it with yourself. You know? The Word is life. To learn the Word is abundant life. The word bears fruit within ourselves. Here, it goes on in the fifth verse of 1 Timothy, third chapter. It says, Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. Underline this part of your Bible. From, from such, withdraw yourself. When you've got people who are trying to get you to feel that if you don't get nothing, if you're not getting anything, you can't have no, you can, there's nothing godly about you. Somebody better tell that to the widow's mite. That, man, that, that widow that is at that little mite. Because she gave more than what you call the wealthy people of her time. She had more godliness in her than they could ever think of. They walked around like they were big shots, but they were really little shots compared to this lady. And I use the expression because she had more of the love of God than within her. Let me read that same verse. Let me amplify. This is a protracted wrangling and worrying discussions and perpetual friction among men who corrupted in my who are corrupted in mind and beareth of the truth. In other words, they know they don't want to be with the truth, who imagine that godliness and imagine that godliness or righteousness is a source of profit, a money making business. A means of livelihood from such withdrawal. There was a story I read uh, in the Old Testament about Simon the sorcerer. When he saw these people doing certain gifts and performing certain things and speaking in tongues, he was trying to buy this because he said, You know something? I need to have this so I can enhance my own wealth on earth. You can't sell the word, the word sells itself. You can't think that it's your anointing 
that heals or, or helps or correct people. It's God's anointing through you. See that? People see and abuse God's word as a state of a livelihood by which they can profit off. But the real profit is that you're building up your wealth in heaven by turning the brothers and sisters away from their wicked way so they can enter into the kingdom with the godliness that they need to possess here on earth. Are you listening to me right here, right now? Are you still looking in the mirror at yourself? This is not about a money-making business. This is about a soul-saving business. Jesus told Peter, and I'm saying, you come follow me, and I'm going to make you fishes of men. Verse 6. This is part I'm getting to. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Verse 7. Hold on to yourself now. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Now, let, let me use this analogy, if I can. <coughs> In the natural, and I know from a lot of uh, <coughs> military families, when you begin to relocate, the first thing you try to do is hire you a moving company to uh, kind of pick up your furniture so it can be moved to the new residence that you're about to go to. That, that's a natural thing, especially you have a whole lot of furniture. Now, the challenge is, what furnishes are we talking about here? Now, we're going to read this down here, but I was wondering, what furniture are we talking about? Now, one of the things that some people say, well, I don't want to take any of this old stuff with me. I'm just going to buy, sell all this stuff off and just buy new stuff, which is one method. Another person may say, well, all this stuff is antique. I like some of this stuff I got here. So I'm going to hire this moving company to take it to my new house. Some people follow that method. The challenge is, from a physical standpoint, last time I checked, when babies come in the world, they come in, and I used to do the expression, but naked. Now, when they, uh, when people go home, we naturally clothe them. Some get cremated and whatever. But the challenge is, they leave here like they came, with no earthly possessions. But the challenge is, you can store up your heavenly possessions while you're here on the earth. But it begins again of understanding who you are. Who you are. I know this sounds confusing, but uh, it's a point I would like to get to right here. Verse 6 and verse 7 in Amplified. It says, And it is indeed a source of immense profit for godliness accompanied with contentment, that contentment which is a sense of inward sufficiency Efficiency is great and abundant gain. Read that again now. Just amplified about this contentment. It's, it's the one that you read say, but God in his with contentment is great gain. It says, but it is indeed a source of immense profit. When the last time that you were just content rather than just fussing about what you don't have and not recognizing what you do have? When the last time you were trying to knock down people to get what you thought that you didn't have, to get what you think they have, because they may have more than what you think you're supposed to have. Now, I'm not going to be able to play a word. I'm just trying to tell it like it is. The challenge is, the scriptures say, no matter what state you're in, no matter what state you're in, to be content. 
We don't know when you're in that godly contentment state. That's when stuff begins to multiply from a spiritual standpoint that you begin to gain those spiritual blessings from God. Not only here on earth, but also above. That's when your profit really begins to build up. That's when you begin to really get a return on your spiritual investment. That state of godly contentment. That's when the real treasure should lie. What? Well, someone said, well, I'm down to my last natural dollar. The scripture said God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in the anointed Christ Jesus. Since I don't walk by sight, I walk by faith. And now faith is the substance of things hoped for, but it's also the evidence of things not seen. Maybe I could be content of really knowing not only who I am, but whose I am. Maybe the challenge about the just must live by faith helped me to understand that God not only has my back, he has my front, my top, my bottom, and my side. But that based on my trust in him. Trust in the Lord with all that heart and lean not to that own understanding. Acknowledge him in all that ways, and he will direct your path. The challenge is, who am I really trying to trust in? Who am I really believing in? Let, 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 me, let me read on this right here. It says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it's sure we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therefore be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptations and a snare and to many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I don't have it. I need to have it. No, you need to have the Word living in you. Because with the Word, this other stuff comes. Those things come. And every food, let me, let me just read that from Amplified again. Amplified verse 8 says, But if we have food and clothing with these, we shall be content, satisfied. Look, look around right now. Is anybody in their house naked right now? Well, you choose to be, but you got clothes somewhere. Uh, are any of y'all uh, uh, who are viewing this outside? You're probably not. If you are, you're out there because you still got a roof over your head. The challenge is, there's a state of contentment that will begin to help you prosper spiritually of understanding that you're not walking by sight, you're walking by faith, you're trusting God no matter what state you're in, you're being content knowing who and who you are and who you are. The challenge is that we must learn contentment here with God in order to receive the full blessing that God has in store for us. Eyes have not seen, nor ears heard, nor in into the hearts of men. Those things that God has for us. But the challenge is the cares of the world is a snare and pull us away from being in that state of contentment with God. And brothers and sisters, I just ran out of time. I got to finish this. So that means that by, uh, part four is on the horizon. There's a state of contentment, brothers and sisters, that we all must have. And we can't allow ourselves to deviate with this. We've got to realize and understand where we really are building our treasures. Because if you really know that earth is not your permanent home, and heaven is, and you know that you're just passing through, 
no matter what you're going through, and I use the term going through, when you trust in God, your end will have the best result that you could ever imagine. Eternal life with Christ. What you give up, you get. What you hold on to, you lose. Your faith will not only make you whole, your faith will keep you whole. But that's a state of trusting God. That's a state of understanding that you can do all things through Christ, through that anointing. That God has given each and every one of us. That dude of his power that comes only from above. Now faith is the substance of things hopeful, but the evidence of things not seen. Where are you today, brothers and sisters? What actually do you see in that mirror today? What state are you in spiritually? Are you in a, uh, a contented state? Or is your mind all discombobulated with a feeling of, what, of wondering what you're going to do when the Bible says, take no thought for tomorrow? But the day is sufficient within itself. Enjoy what you have today. God is your source. He's all of us. And no matter what you go through, it takes faith to bring you through. Let's pray. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I thank you again for your word. I thank you for that anointing, Father God, that destroys the yoke. I thank you for allowing me and helping me, Father God, to take inventory of not only who I am, but whose I am, Father. And I praise you today, Father God, for the victory that you've already given each and every one of us. Not going to give us, already given us. But it's based on our covenant of understanding the covenant that you've already laid out for each and every one of us. Help us to walk in this statue. Help us to walk into the fulfillment that you've already laid out for each and every one of us who trust in you, Father. Lord, I praise you right now for each and every person on the side of this voice that they're listening to you and not to me. That, Father God, that your anointing is destroying the yokes upon them right now, Father. That, Father God, they're letting loose, they're cutting loose the things that that's down here and reaching for the things that are above, pressing on towards the high calling, the high thing, the permanent thing, the eternal thing, which is in Christ Jesus. Lord, I thank you today. I praise you, Father God, because, Lord, Jesus always stated your faith has made you hope. No matter what we see, no matter what we hear, no matter what we're going through, Father God, we're standing on your word. The word that was sent to heal as well as to deliver. And we praise you, Father. We praise you for that faith, that anointing, Father God, that you left for each and every one of us, Father God. That comfort of Father God, your Holy Spirit, guiding and directed, Father. Lord, continue to, continue to direct, continue to guide, Father. Help us, Father God, not only to hear, but to adhere to the blessings that are already here. Help us to walk in that state of contentment no matter what. And we thank you in advance. We thank you in advance for the victory, the victory, the victory that we already have with you in you and through you this day and each and every day. In your most precious son, Jesus' name, let the church go. Amen.